Well, it's the night before Thanksgiving in the year 2020. I'm going to read you a piece by Herman Melville. It is called The Paradise of Bachelors and the Tartars of Maids. My guess is this will take, because it starts on page 1257 and ends on page 1279, probably about half an hour, maybe a little longer than that. Uh, the Tartarus of Maids is the part that really interests me, uh, not only because of its sheer description of nature, but uh, it seems to be the real point. Uh, anyway, Paradise of Bachelors goes from 1257 to 1265. Tartarus of Maids takes up the rest of it. And uh, he probably wrote this a year or two after Moby Dick was published, which would have been in 1851. The Paradise of Bachelors and the Tartarus of Maids. One, the Paradise of Bachelors. It lies not far from Temple Bar. Going to it by the usual way is like stealing from a heated plain into some cool, deep glen, shady among the harboring hills. Sick with the din and soiled with the mud of Fleet Street, where the Benedict tradesmen are hurrying by, with ledger lines ruled along their brows, thinking upon rise of bread and fall of babies, you adroitly turn a mystic corner, not a street, glide down a glim, monastic way, flanked by dark, sedate, and solemn piles, and still wending on, give the whole careworn world the slip, and, disentangled, stand beneath the quiet cloisters of the Paradise of Bachelors. Sweet are the, oas sweet are the oases in Sahara, charming the isle groves of august prairies, delectable pure faith amidst a thousand perfidies, but sweeter, still more charming, most delectable, the dreamy Paradise of Bachelors, found in the stony heart of stunning London. In mild meditation, pace the cloisters, Take your pleasure, sip your leisure, in the garden waterward. Go linger in the ancient library, go worship in the sculptured chapel. But little have you seen, just nothing do you know. Not the sweet kernel have you tasted, till you dine among the banded bachelors, and see their convivial eyes and glasses sparkle. Not dine in bustling commons during term time in the hall, but tranquilly, by private hint, at a private table, some fine Templar's hospitably invited guest. Templar? That's a romantic name. Let me see. Brian de Boy Gilbert was a Templar, I believe. Do we understand you to insinuate that those many, that those famous Templars still survive in modern London? May the ring of their armed heels be heard, and the rattle of their shields, as in mailed prayer the monk knights kneel before the consecrated host. Surely a monk knight were a curious sight, picking his way along the strand, his gleaming corslet and snowy surcoat spattered by an omnibus, long-bearded, too, according to his order's rule his face fuzzy as a pard's. How would the grim ghost look among the crop-haired, close-shaven citizens? We know, indeed, sad history recounts it, that a moral blight tainted at last this sacred brotherhood. Though no sordid foe might outskill them in the fence, yet the, warm, yet the worm of luxury crawled beneath their guard, gnawing the core of knightly troth, nibbling the monastic vow, till at last the monk's austerity relaxed, to wassailing, and the sworn knights' bachelors grew to be but hypocrites and rakes. But for all this, quite unprepared were we to learn that knights' templars, if at all in being, were so entirely secularized as to be reduced from carving out immoral fame and glorious battling for the Holy Land to the carving of roast mutton at a dinner board. Like an acreon, do these degenerate Templars now think it sweeter far to fall in banquet than in war? Or, indeed, how can there be any survival of that famous order? Templars in modern London. Templars in their Red Cross mantles smoking cigars at the divan. Templars crowded in a railway train till, stacked with steel helmet, spear, and shield, the whole train looks like one elongated locomotive. No, the genuine Templar is long since departed. Go view the wondrous tombs in the temple church. 
See there, the rigidly haughty forms stretched out with crossed arms upon their stilly hearts in everlasting and undreaming rest. Like the years before the flood, the bold Knights Templars are no more. Nevertheless, the name remains, and the nominal society, and the ancient grounds, and some of the ancient edifices. But the iron heel is changed to a boot of patent leather, the long two-handled sword to a one-handled quill. The monk giver of gratuitous ghostly counsel now counsels for a fee. The defender of the sarcophagus, if in good practice with his weapon, now has more than one case to defend. The vowed opener and clearer of all highways leading to the holy sepulchre now has it in particular charge to check, to clog, to hinder, and embarrass all the courts and avenues of law. The knight combatant of the Saracen, breasting spear points at Acre, now fights low points in Westminster Hall. The helmet is a wig, struck by time struck by time's enchanter's wand. The Templar is today a lawyer. But like many others, tumbled from proud glory's height, like the apple, hard on the bough but mellow on the ground, the Templar's fall has but made him all the finer fellow. I dare say those old warrior priests were but gruff and grouty at the best. Cased in Birmingham hardware, how could their crimped arms give yours or mine a hearty shake? Their proud, ambitious, monkish souls clasped shut like hornbook missiles, their very faces clapped in bombshells. What sort of genial men were these? But best of comrades, most affable of hosts, capital diner is the modern Templar. His wit and wine are both of sparkling brands. The church and cloisters, courts and vaults, lanes and passages, banquet halls, refectories, libraries, terraces, gardens, broad walks, domiciles, and desert rooms, covering, oh, dessert rooms, pardon me, covering a very large space of ground, and all grouped in central neighborhood, and quite sequestered from the old city's surrounding din, and everything about the place being kept in most bachelor-like particularity, no part of London offers to a quiet white so agreeable of refuge. The temple is, indeed, a city by itself, a city with all the best appurtenances, as the above enumeration shows, a city with a park to it, and flower beds, and a riverside, the Thames flowing by as openly in one part, as by Eden's primal garden flowed the mild Euphrates. In what is now the temple garden, the old crusaders used to exercise their steeds and lances. The modern Templars now lounge on the benches beneath the trees and switching their patent leather boots in gay discourse exercise at repartee. Long lines of stately portraits in the banquet halls show what great men of mark, famous nobles, judges, and lord chancellors have in their time been Templars. But all Templars are not known to universal fame, though if the having warm hearts and warmer welcomes, full minds and fuller of cellars, and giving good advice and glorious dinners, spiced with rare divertisements of fun and fancy, merit immortal mention, set down he uses the names of RFC and his imperial brother. Though to be a Templar, in the one true sense, you must need Though to be a Templar, in the one true sense, you must needs be a lawyer or a student of the law, and be ceremoniously enrolled as member of the order. Yet, as many such, though Templars, do not reside within the temple's precincts, though they may have their offices there, just so, on the other hand, there are many residents of the hoary old lounging gentleman and bachelor, or a quiet, unmarried literary man, charmed with the soft seclusion of the spot, you much desire to pitch your shady tent among the rest in this serene encampment. Then you must make some special friend among the order and procure him to rent in his name but at your charge whatever vacant chamber you may find to suit. Thus, I suppose, did, Don, did Dr. Johnson, that nominal Benedict and widower but virtual battler. I'm going to start that sentence again. Thus, I suppose, did Dr. Johnson, that nominal Benedict and widower but virtual bachelor, when for a space he resided here. So, too, did that undoubted bachelor and rare good soul Charles Lamb, and hundreds more of sterling spirits, brethren of the order of celibacy, from time to time have dined, and slept, and tabernacled here. Indeed, the place is all a honeycomb of offices and domiciles. Like any cheese, it is quite perforated through and through in all directions with the snug cells of bachelors. Dear, delightful spot, 
Ah, when I bethink me of the sweet hours there past, enjoying such genial hospitalities beneath the, those time-honored roofs, my heart only finds due utterance through poetry, and with a sigh I softly sing, Carry me back to old Virginia. Such then at large is the paradise of bachelors, and such I found it one pleasant afternoon in the smiling month of May, when, sallying from my hotel in Trafalgar Square, I went to keep my dinner appointment with that fine barrister, bachelor, and bencher, RFC. He is the first and second, and should be the third, I hereby nominate him, whose card I kept fast pinched between my gloved forefinger and thumb, and every now and then snatched still another look at the pleasant address inscribed beneath the name. Number dash, Elm Court Temple. At the core, he was a right bluff, carefree, right comfortable, and most companionable Englishman. If on a first acquaintance he seemed reserved, quite icy in his air, patience, this champagne will thaw. And if it never do, better frozen champagne than liquid vinegar. There were nine gentlemen, all bachelors, at the dinner. One was from number dash, King's Bench Walk Temple a second, third, and fourth, and fifth from various courts or passages christened with some similarly rich, resounding syllables. It was indeed a sort of senate of the bachelors, sent to this dinner from widely scattered districts to represent the general celibacy of the temple. Nay, it was, by representation, a grand parliament of the best bachelors in universal London, several of those present being from distant quarters of the town, noted immemorial seats of lawyers and unmarried men, Lincoln's Inn, Furnival's Inn, and one gentleman, upon whom I looked with a sort of collateral awe, hailed from the spot where Lord Verulam once abode a bachelor, Gray's Inn. The, uh, the apartment was well up toward heaven. I know not how many strange old stairs I climbed to get to it. But a good dinner, with famous company, should be well earned. No doubt our host had his dining room so high, with a view to secure the prior exercise necessary to the due relishing and digesting of it. The furniture was wonderfully unpretending, old and snug. No new shining mahogany, sticky with undried varnish, no uncomfortably luxurious ottomans, and sofas too fine to use, vexed you in this sedate apartment. It is a thing which every sensible American should learn from every sensible Englishman, that glare and glitter, gimcracks and gewgaws are not indispensable to domestic solacement. The American Benedict snatches downtown a tough chop in a gilded show box. The English bachelor leisurely dines at home on that incomparable south down of his off a plain deal board. The ceiling of the room was low. Who wants to dine under the dome of St. Peter's? High ceilings. If that is your demand, and the higher the better, and you be so very tall, then go dine out with the topping giraffe in the open air. In good time, the nine gentlemen sat down to nine covers, and soon we and soon were fairly underway. If I remember right, oxtail soup inaugurated the affair. Of a rich russet hue, its agreeable flavor dissipated my first confounding of its main ingredient with teamsters' gads and the rawhides of ushers. By way of interlude, we here drank a little claret. Neptune's was the next tribute rendered. Turbo coming second, snow white, flaky, and just gelatinous enough not to turtleish in its unctuousness. At this point, we refresh ourselves with a glass of sherry. After these light skirmishers had vanished, the heavy artillery of the feast marched in, led by that well-known English Generalissimo roast beef. For aides de camp, we had a saddle of mutton, a fat turkey, a chicken pie, and an... An and endless other savory things, while for avant couriers came nine silver flagons of humming ale. This heavy ordnance having departed on the track of the light skirmishers, a picked brigade of gamefowl encamped upon the board, their campfires lit by the ruddiest of decanters. Tarts and puddings followed, with innumerable niceties, then cheese and crackers. By way of ceremony, simply, only to keep up good old fashions, we here each drank a glass of good old port. The cloth was now removed, and, like Blucher's army coming in at the death in, on the field of Waterloo, in marched a fresh detachment of bottles, dusty with their hurried march. 
All these maneuverings of the forces were superintended by a surprising old field marshal, I cannot school myself to call him by the inglorious name of waiter, with snowy hair and napkin, and a head like Socrates. Amidst all the hilarity of the feast, intent on important business, he disdained to smile. Venerable man! I have above endeavored to give some slight schedule of the general plan of operations, but anyone knows that a good genial dinner is a sort of pell-mell indiscriminate affair, quite baffling to detail in all particulars. Thus I spoke of taking gla a glass of claret and a glass of sherry and a glass of port and a mug of ale, all at certain specific periods and times, but those were merely the state bumpers, so to speak. Innumerable impromptu glasses were drained between the periods of those grand imposing ones. The nine bachelors seemed to have the most tender concern for each other's health. All the time, in flowing wine, they most earnestly expressed their sincerest wishes for the entire well-being and lasting hygiene of the gentlemen on the right and on the left. I noticed that when one of these kind bachelors desired a little more wine, just for his stomach's sake, like Timothy, he would not help himself to it unless some other bachelor would join him. It seemed held something indelicate, selfish, and unfraternal to be seen taking a lonely, unparticipated glass. Meantime, as the wine ran apace, the spirits of the company grew more and more to perfect genialness and unconstraint. They related all sorts of pleasant stories. Choice experiences in their private lives were now brought out like choice brands of Moselle or Rhenish, only kept for particular company. One told how mellowly he lived when a student at Oxford, with various spicy anecdotes of most frank-hearted noble lords, his liberal companions. Another bachelor, a gray-headed man with a sunny face, who by his own account embraced every opportunity of leisure to cross over into the low countries on sudden tours of inspection of the fine old Flemish architecture there, this learned, white-haired, sunny-faced old bachelor excelled in his descriptions of the elaborate splendors of those guild halls, of those old guild halls, town halls, and stethold houses to be seen in the land of the ancient Flemings. A third was a great frequenter of the British Museum and knew all about scores of wonderful antiquities of Oriental manuscripts and costly books without a duplicate. A fourth had lately returned from a trip to old Grenada and, of course, was full of Saracenic scenery. A fifth had a funny case in law to tell. A sixth was crudite in wines. Oh, pardon me. A sixth was erudite in wines. A seventh had a strange characteristic anecdote of the private life of the Iron Duke, never printed and never before announced in any public or private company. An eighth had lately been amusing his evenings, now and then, with translating a comic poem of Pulci's. He quoted for us the more amusing passages. And so the evening slipped along, the hours told, not by a water clock like King Alfred's, but a wine chronometer. Meantime, the table seemed a sort of Epsom Heath, a regular ring where the decanters galloped round. For fear one decanter should not with sufficient speed reach its, his destination, another was sent express after him to hurry him, and then a third to hurry the second, and so on with a fourth and fifth. And throughout all this, nothing loud, nothing unmannerly, nothing turbulent. I am quite sure, from the scrupulous gravity and austerity of his air, that had Socrates, the field marshal, perceived aught of indecorum in the company he served, he would have forthwith departed without giving warning. I afterward learned that, during the repast, an invalid bachelor in an adjoining chamber enjoying his first sound refreshing slumber in three long weary weeks. Something's missing there. I afterward learned that, during the repast, an invalid bachelor in an adjoining chamber enjoyed his first sound refreshing slumber in three long weary weeks. It was the very perfection of quiet absorption of good living, good drinking, good feeling, and good talk. We were a band of brothers. Comfort, fraternal household comfort, was the grand trait of the affair. Also, you could plainly see that these easy-hearted men had no wives or children to give an anxious thought. Almost all of them were travelers, too, for bachelors alone can travel freely and without any twinges of their consciences touching desertion of the fireside. 
The thing called pain, the bugbear style trouble, those two legends seemed preposterous to their bachelor imaginations. How could men of liberal sense, ripe scholarship in the world, and capacious philosophical and convivial understandings, how could they suffer themselves to be imposed upon by such monkish fables? Pain, trouble, as well talk of Catholic miracles, no such thing. Pass the sherry, sir. Poo poo can't be. The sort, sir, if you please, nonsense, don't tell me so. The decanter stops with you, sir, I believe. And so it went. Not long after the cloth was drawn, our host glanced significantly upon Socrates, who, solemnly stepping to a stand, returned with an immense convolved horn, a regular Jericho horn, mounted with polished silver, and otherwise chaste and curiously enriched, not omitting two lifelike goat's heads, with four more horns of solid silver, projecting from opposite sides of the mouth of the noble main horn. Not having heard that our host was a performer on the bugle, I was surprised to see him lift this horn from the table as if he were about to blow an inspiring blast. But I was relieved from this and set quite right as touching the purposes of the horn by his now inserting his thumb and forefinger into its mouth, whereupon a slight aroma was stirred up and my nostrils were greeted with the smell of some choice rapé. It was a mull of snuff. It went the rounds. Capital idea this, thought I, of taking snuff about this juncture. This goodly fashion must be introduced among my countrymen at home, further ruminated I. The remarkable decorum of the nine bachelors, a decorum not to be affected by any quantity of wine, a decorum unassailable by any degree of mirthfulness, this was again set in a forcible light to me by now observing that, though they took snuff very freely, not yet a man so far violated the proprieties or so far molested the invalid bachelor in the adjoining room as to indulge himself in a sneeze. The snuff was snuffed silently, as if it had been some fine and noxious powder brushed off the wings of butterflies. But fine though they be, Bachelor's dinners, like bachelor's lives, cannot endure forever. The time came for breaking up. One by one, the bachelors took their hats, and two by two, and arm in arm, they descended, still conversing to the flagging of the court, some going to their neighboring chambers to turn over the decameron, ere retiring for the night, some to smoke a cigar, promenading in the garden on the cool riverside, some to make for the street, call a hack, and be driven snugly snugly to their distant lodgings. I was the last lingerer. Well, said my smiling host, what do you think of the temple here, and the sort of life we bachelors make out to live in it? Sir, said I, with a burst of admiring candor, sir, this is the very paradise of bachelors. I'll end this particular video here. The second part is longer. I'll give it a video of its own. And again, the second part is the main event. That's really the introduction. That's Herman Melville from sometime around 1851, and uh, the other video we'll post soon.